Welcome. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar featuring the latest technology platform developed by Met One Instruments powered by ACOM, the ES-808 SCAMP, System Contamination and Meteorological Platform. I'm Graham Hetland, Marketing Manager at Met One ACOM, and I will be moderating today's webinar. First, some quick housekeeping. Please feel free to type any questions you have for today's presenters regarding the SCAMP in the questions tab, and our panel will field them at the end of the presentation. If you have any technical issues or trouble viewing or hearing our presentation today, please let us know using the chat tab so I can help you troubleshoot. Also, this session will be recorded, so in case you'd like to review this content later or share this webinar with friends or colleagues, you will receive a link to the recording shortly after the webinar has ended. Now to introduce our speakers for today, Bill Bars and Sean Hendricks. Bill Bars is the business development and applications engineer here at Met One ECOM, and he brings decades of experience working with contamination monitoring and particle counting, uh, utilizing precision meteorological tools. Bill serves in many diverse capacities, ranging from manufacturing and quality engineering to application science. He's an active member of the U.S. National Wildfire Suppression Association. Sean Hendricks is base manager for Grayback Forestry USA and brings 34 years of wildland fire suppression, prescribed fire, and natural resource management experience. As the base manager, he is responsible for the daily operations, recruiting, training, and safety of all personnel at the Merlin base and is considered an expert in forest fire management. Now I'll turn it over to you, gentlemen. Okay. Well, Graham, thank you very much for the introduction. Um, I'd like to extend my thanks uh, to Sean Hendricks. You know, he's serving as our guest, but also as our subject matter expert. Um, Sean just brings a wealth of experience and, and talent to this webinar. So again, we greatly appreciate your time, Sean. So um, I think I'm gonna turn the wheel over to Sean at this point in time and just let him talk a little bit about Grayback Forestry, uh, what their role is in prescribed fire and, and fuels reduction mitigation and you know how they support the other agencies that are kind of listed on this slide. So, uh, Sean. Good morning, everyone, or whatever time you are, wherever you're at. Uh, again, Sean Hendricks with Grayback Forestry. I've worked here 33 years plus. Grayback started in 1979 when the U.S. Forest Service Hiskey Smoke Jumper Base in Cave Junction, Oregon was beginning to close. Um, Grayback started. And Grayback started as a, a fuels company doing tree planting, uh, thinning, and got into prescribed burning in the mid 80s and got into wildfire suppression in the early 90s and has just uh, continued with that. Through the course of the 90s and into the 2000s and to present, Grayback has been a leader in prescribed burning throughout the USA. Uh, particularly the Pacific Northwest. We service uh, Montana, Washington, California, Oregon, and some of the Great Basin states um, with prescribed burns. Uh, just most recently, we were awarded some contracts, 10 years with the U.S. Forest Service to conduct prescribed burns throughout the, the state of Oregon and some of Washington and Montana. You know, with all that, we support the agencies. We complement uh, the Oregon Department of Forestry, the U.S. Forest Service, the Bureau of Land Management, some other municipalities, the uh, Nature Conservancy, Southern Oregon Land Conservancy, uh, Oregon Fish and Wildlife, and others. And, and with that, you know, we bring our experience. You know, besides myself, Grayback has numerous other individuals that have 30 plus years experience in prescribed burning and wildland fire suppression. And we've uh, created a name for ourselves and the industry is, you know, this is an industry on the contract side. And as I mentioned, we do support the agencies. We're not looking to take them over. We're just looking to support them whenever needs they have. And there's a big push to put fire back on the landscape, you know, of many years of being very good at wildfire suppression. Uh, with that, you know, putting fire on the landscape, we're here and ready to respond to whatever agency or private landowner needs some help in, you know, doing that, whether it's burn planning or carrying out the prescribed burn itself. Excellent. Thank you, sir. Uh, next slide, please, Graham. Next slide, Graham, please. There we go. 
uh, one back. I'm sorry. So basically, how this this whole project got going is, um, you know, I I gave Sean, I got his name from a mutual friend uh, in the fire community. Uh, basically, called him up. He was gracious enough to grant me uh, some time to go chat about this, and so I went out to Grayback Forestry, and, and we stood in the parking lot, and we just kind of talked a little bit about who Grayback was. We talked about who Met One was, and and the fact that we've been in, an industry expert for 30 plus years and contamination monitoring and meteorological uh, equipment monitoring. <clears throat> and we, you know, thought this might be a nice marriage um, where we can actually produce an instrument, a useful instrument where they can uh, use this for prescribed burning specifically, but also uh, it appears there's other applications this thing will serve. Um, and the conversation, you know, the need to support prescribed burning was kind of number one. Uh, they needed something to perform on-site modeling of, of the weather environmental conditions prior to the burns, you know, what allows creation of an effective burn plan in those populated areas, you know, we want to minimize that smoke impact to the local population. Um, you know, we want to measure the environmental conditions during the actual prescribed burn and at the site to determine if the affected area, you know, is still in prescription, um, whether there are many parameters that, that go into that decision, you know, whether something's in or out of prescription. And or they would need to postpone it until you know the, the unit was back in prescription and it's safe to continue. You know, one of the things that I asked Sean, I said, well, what do you use today uh, to to give you that weather information? He said, well, you know, there's an instrument called the ROS. And the ROS system is a, basically it's an acronym for the remote automated weather station. And this is uh, accessible online. So there's 2,200 of these ROS systems that are deployed around the US. Uh, they're accessible again from you know online, and so they can pull that that critical weather data <clears throat> from that instrumentation. The downside um, is that they may not be strategically located where we need those for to, to do the actual prescribed burn. Uh, excuse me. So I thought, okay, so if, if we were able to produce an instrument. Uh, that could be used right on the actual site of the prescribed burn. So you could create an effective burn plan based on modeling of the weather prior to that burn. You know, would that be a value? And, and Sean said, yeah, that would, that would be very helpful. So that kind of kicked the, this project off. And I took this information back to our principals uh, and then we started a conversation. Um, so next slide, please. So this slide talks about, you know, the, the raw system and the fact that it's, uh, it's, it's very useful, um, but it's really not portable. It's quite heavy. It takes a couple of people to move it around if indeed it's not a, a fixed site, if this is a, a mobile site. Um, but it did not offer, you know, the, the PM or particulate monitoring or the, or the carbon monoxide uh, that the SCAMP actually offers today. So next slide, please. Next slide. And so, you know, this is the what. So Sean, uh, in conjunction with uh, reps from the U.S. Forest Service and the uh, Department of Forestry, it became apparent that there was a need and desire for an instrument that could be deployed quickly uh, by a single person uh, via vehicle or by an industrial-sized drone. Because one of the things that Sean and I talked about was the future of firefighting. He said, would you like to see the future of firefighting? And then um, I said, of course. Uh, and so he showed me you know, the industrial sized drone that had a pay, payload of 100 pounds um, that had a flight time of up to three hours uh, because it was a, a hybrid unit, you know, that used fuel and uh, battery, onboard battery. And um, I thought, well, if we could produce an instrument that was small enough, compact enough, but yet feature rich enough to serve their need uh, then we might we might have a winning combination, and so that prompted you know the conversation about these user needs that you can see per uh, per the slide, and it's you know the wind is, wind speed, wind direction, uh, the temperature, the barometric pressure, the humidity, those were all uh, just critical weather parameters. Uh, in addition to the particulate monitoring at PM 2.5 and PM 10, and then the carbon monoxide, and carbon monoxide was really important. Um, you know, related to firefighter safety. This is becoming more and more of an issue, uh, not just for firefighters, you know, in the fire camps, but also deployed, but also the local community that are impacted by the heavy smoke. Um, so this, this instrument could be useful in that capacity as well. Um, we wanted to be able to communicate 
you know, via cell communications, so the cell tower. Uh, we wanted the information to be accessible in the hands of the firefighters and those, you know, decision makers that are actually on site or even at their, the, you know, their office uh, via a web portal software program that we use. Um, and so, you know, we can talk to this thing almost, I think it takes about five minutes for the instrument to come online after you push the on button. And so it's streaming data that quickly and uh, it's pretty effective. I'm going to, Sean's going to go into a little bit more detail about that later. Um, but the fact is uh, part of this web portal allows you to see the actual GPS location of the instrument. Uh, it can be powered both locally. So if you want to have, you know, it's got a two day battery life, onboard batteries. It's got a solar uh, option as well for extended field use, which we have, uh, we've done that a couple of different times. And also it's got an AC power supply. So if you want to plug it in uh, where there's AC power available, you know, it can, it can run indefinitely. You know, all this, all these features in, this, in a complete, compact, robust package, no moving parts. Um, you know, it's versatile also. It could be potentially used uh, for non-fire related activities and applications like, you know, monitoring for cities and the schools, um, for smoke impact, et cetera, for in municipalities, you know, FEMA activities. And, and I'm going to go into some more detail about these other applications later on. Um, but that's just kind of touching on that for now. Uh, so next slide. Next, thank you, sir. And so, you know, the big why. So the focus design of this was originally for a prescribed fire for fuels reduction. And so, again, I'm going to turn the wheel over to Sean, and he's going to kind of walk us through the fact, you know, it was prescribed fire, you know, it's, it's used to meet many management objectives, and it's not just reducing fuels. It's got other benefits as well. And so Sean can go into some detail uh, about that. So here you go, Sean. Yeah, so, you know, the big why, and it comes straight from Washington, D.C., the chief of the Forest Service, the chief of the Department of Interior and Department of uh, well, every forestry department to increase the pace and scale of prescribed burning and fuels reduction out west and throughout the country. You know, wildfires have cost billions of dollars every year. Currently, there's smoke impacts to New York City and Washington, D.C. because of wildfires in Canada. And, you know, people are taking notice. You know, senators, the president even, take a notice that something has to be done. There's billions of dollars being spent on wildfire suppression. But if we were to increase the pace and scale of prescribed burning in the shoulder seasons of wildfire, that would save money and doing fuels treatments, uh, fuel hazard reduction, cutting, thinning, piling and prescribed burning. So with that, you know, we were working to develop this, you know, we, we want to use technology moving forward um, to the best of our knowledge and our ability to increase that pace and scale and be efficient with, with uh, public dollars here in the United States. You know, prescribed fire, it's an important management tool. It goes back thousands of years um, that our forests were managed with prescribed fire. Beginning in the early 1900s, we became very successful at stopping fires. But with that came a cost of, you know, the trees and brush and everything kept growing. And our fuels became, our forests became overstocked with flammable material. And, you know, years of you know, climate changes, um, trees dying and mortality happening, you know, fires have become more extreme, you know, hotter temperatures, lower humidities, more fuels have led to catastrophic wildfires and, and really push smoke impacts right into the wildland urban interface into people's faces and cause people to have illnesses and diseases because of this. So, you know, when Bill approached me, we started talking about all these things and, you know, me being a prescribed burn boss and a prescribed fire manager, uh, you know, I brought up some of these things and he said, well, I think we can help you with this. And we developed the scamp, you know, working through it, you know, just some of the quotes and bullets on this slide, you know, reducing the hazardous fuels, protecting human and communities, you know, Prescribed fire minimizes the spread of pests. Some 
species of brush and or plants need fire to reproduce. Um, fire also removes unwanted species, invasive species from ecosystems, provides forage for wildlife, improves habitat, recycles nutrients back into the soil, and promotes the growth of the healthy, healthy trees, flowers, and plants. You know, with that said, you know, this is the directive from the Chief of the Forest Service to bring fire back to the landscape. There's millions of dollars being allocated throughout the country to increase the pace and scale. And you'll hear that quite a bit. You know, they want to go from thousands of acres a year treated to 50 to 100 thousands to a million acres a year treated as in there's millions, even close to a billion dollars going to be allocated to this over the next 10 years. So with that, you know, we wanted to develop this weather monitoring device to, you know, make things more efficient from our end, you know, stretch those dollars out, narrow our burn windows down, fine tune when we burn that the chances of escape will be minimal or non-existent. And with that, you know, we've demoed this out a bit and I'll turn it back to Bill for. Okay. So go ahead and go yeah. to the next slide, Graham, please. So, so uh, this is the, you know, the list of the field trials and it's not all of them. It's most of them. Uh, well, this is where the rubber meets the road from this particular product. You know, like all things, all theoretical situations, until you get this instrument out in the field, in the hands of the people that can usefully or use it uh, in a useful manner. Uh, it's, all, it's all rhetoric and, and supposition, but we were able to get some of these units out in the field in Sean's hand on these actual prescribed burns. And I'd like for Sean to kind of just walk through this, you know, the, the questions at the bottom, you know, maybe how each one of these burns, uh, you know, maybe how the scamp was actually deployed, you know, when you begin taking measurements related to that particular burn, you know, how you positioned it, you know, what information, uh, from the scamp was useful, you know, um, remote, they were all remote deployment. And then, you know, maybe at the end of it, you can kind of talk a little bit about, because you mentioned this to me the other day, about after burn weather trends, you know, to ensure there's no flare ups. And so, um, you know, you actually left the scamp deployed for some time at the airport burn, uh, just for that fact. So maybe you could just kind of walk through those upper, those upper uh, burns that we talked about. Sounds good. So the Hillcrest slash pile burn right within the city of Grants Pass, Oregon, you know, houses all around 10 acres, you know, a few hundred slash piles. And it was in, I believe, February when we first tried this out. So we just got it developed with Met One and Bill said, hey, this is ready to go. Let's try it out. And I said, OK, I got the spot. We put it out there by hand. It was a big battery, had to pack it up the hill, a little heavy, cumbersome. And this is still part of the R&D part of the scamp, mind you. So we set it out and just were monitoring the smoke right on the right in the burn unit. And it spiked a little bit. Spike mean came up in the PMS level some, nothing concerning. But, uh, you know, that was part of the reason to, to monitor that. The next burn, the Waters Creek prescribed burn, was a couple hundred acres southwest of Grants Pass. We put the scamp out a couple days before, and by then it had the internal batteries. It developed to the next stage, and we set it out there for 48 hours, and we're monitoring the weather pre-burn just so we could, you know, monitor the basically the RH trends. We go out and we check our fuel moistures with a moisture meter and such, and and get a baseline of the weather parameters of when the best prescribed burn window will be. So that helped us monitor that. And that was a successful burn. The Trail Lost Creek area prescribed burn, that was up north of Medford. It was more in April, May time. We put it out there previous of the you know days before the burn just to monitor the weather trends and had it out there on the burn day. But, you know, leading up to it, we were monitoring the scamp and we noticed that there was a trend of the relative humidities below 20% for three or four straight days. So at that point, we decided we were out of prescription. And this was put out in a, you know, an area that was a long drive. I would have had to drive there every day to check fuels, take weather, put in spot weather forecast, but I did not have to do that. The scamp was in place. 
and I could just pull it up on my phone, get the weather data I needed, put in for the spot forecast. And that really helped in narrowing down that burn window. We shut it down, waited three or four days, a tenth of inch, an inch of rain came through with some thunderstorms, dampened the unit. We were able to pick it back up you know, days after, one day after that, as it dried out pretty quick and carry out the prescribed burn was very successful. We left it in place for a couple of days just to monitor post burn weather trend, mainly our age, you know, and uh, it was up in the high 20s, low 30s. So, you know, we were able to monitor that easily. Out in O'Brien, Oregon, south of the or Oregon, about a mile from the California border, we had a combined uh, Oregon State University sponsored burn with a private landowner and we put the scamp out there just to help and show Oregon State University what we were doing. It was only a two acre burn, but put it in place three or four days prior to the burn, we narrowed it down to the day of the burn and, you know, two days before fire season kicked off here in Southern Oregon, we we carried out that burn, was successful, left it there a few days just to, again to monitor the weather. And at that point in time, we had uh, solar. So Bill came up with the solar panels that would connect so we can just leave that out on site days, weeks at a time. As long as there's sun out within 48 hours, it'll recharge the batteries and, and that proved successful. The next burn near the Medford Airport, airport was a burn, there's actually two of them we had, 100 acres each, grass and oak woodlands, really near a big community, a couple hundred thousand people in Medford, uh, smaller community, Central Point, White City, the Medford Airport, Rogue Valley International was within a mile of this burn. So carrying out this burn, we could not put smoke towards the airport and or we couldn't burn so we had we put the scamp out a week before and we're just monitoring the weather trends we end up getting a shot of rain with a thunderstorm again which uh you know we decided not to burn as we had a north wind set up for four or five days in a row which was going right towards uh, a country music festival that was in Medford. So we decided not to burn because we were gonna smoke out the country music festival, it was Father's Day weekend, then a thunderstorm happened and we decided to wait. A Couple days after that, the weather passed through, the trend was more of a westerly wind, which uh, things dried out fast enough, just monitoring the weather parameters, mainly temperature RH as grass is very susceptible to relative humidity and dialed that right into the exact date and time that we started to burn when the humidity would be in the mid fifties, mid forties to start the grass burn. And that was at 10 AM, I think a week ago yesterday. Yep. I think the 21st, yeah, the first day of summer we, we burned. And we were in fire season, so this took a lot of permitting with the local fire districts, the Oregon Department of Forestry. You know, having this technology and our experience with Grayback Forestry of being a professional burn company, we were granted the permits to burn and that we had monitored the weather, used the SCAMP to work with the NOAA weather out of Medford, Oregon to dial that in. You know, all the times the scamp was deployed by hand, uh, very easy without the battery, just with the solar panels, you can set it up and in less than one minute. And if you have good cell service, you'll have readings on your cell phone or wherever, or whoever has the link within one minute of uh, setting up the scamp of what the current weather conditions are. In the past, we've used Kestrel devices, weather monitoring devices, uh, sling slychometers to, you know, spin the weather, measure the temperature, wet bowl temperature, figure the RH and all that. Um, where is the best position related to the actual burn? You know, that varies where the scamps are. You know, I envision being able to set up two or three of these at any different locations at different elevations. Here in Southern Oregon, we have a lot of thermal belts that, you know, will hold uh, humidity higher down low, below 2000 feet. So I like to set these and envision setting these up in multiple locations to have, you know, really fine tune that weather. And especially in the urban interface where there's lots of community, lots of population, 
just being able to monitor this and then monitor smoke uh, issues during and or after. You know, talked about the battery and the solar panel that worked out great having the solar panel and then after the burn you know a lot of times on the burn day there's really not that big of an issue with the burn itself as you have all the resources on hand you need you have your contingency resources everybody's there but the days after are very important if not more important than the burn day because you scale down your resources you are mopping up but you may not have everybody out there every day you don't see any smokes but then the weather trends hotter and drier and you know you may have missed a smoke you know what we have we have a uas program with a drone and we fly thermal imaging to check for heat but also with that we can have the scamp on site to monitor that temperature and rh and even put it in a location where if a smoke were to pop up it could sniff it out and you'd see uh, increase in the PM levels of smoke and, you know, hey, there's something out there. We better go look, even though we're looking every day up to a week or 10 days after a burn. You know, we're having that uh, in place and being able to monitor that it was really helpful in, you know, making sure a fire does not escape two, three days, week after the burn, because that is that is a very huge issue and has happened around gotcha you know in using this you know you know in the state of oregon there's a you know we have to go through smoke management to get clearance to burn and having this in place will help monitor you know smoke exposure smoke exposure exposure to the communities you know monitoring the wind directions and the trends in that to see which direction the smoke will go uh, monitoring the time of day so we know when to start and when to stop a lot of times in the off seasons winter early spring late fall um, inversion set in and smoke sets in the valleys and we have a narrow window to burn say between 11 a.m and 3 p.m that'll just help fine tune that and you know help us be more successful in our burns Excellent. Next slide, please. Thank you, Sean. Um, so this is this is the dashboard that you can see that be resident on your desktop computer. Uh, the, the mobile application is similar, but it doesn't have the wide angle, wide screen view that you have. It's more of a vertical um, scrolling view, but the same information is available in in both um, in both venues. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, Sean, could you maybe talk just briefly about, you know, the value and, and what the tangible value of the system provided for you? So, yeah, this was valuable to me and our burn teams as we could put this in pre-burn, monitor the weather. You know, we'd have to drive there once to set it up, but then over the next few days or week, we would not have to drive there. So it saved me time. And that is an efficiency with time comes a cost. So it, uh, the value there was multifaceted, you know, saving the time and then a monetary value of being more efficient in my time and planning other burns or doing other tasks. And then just being able to pull this up at a moment's notice and have the current weather conditions on site. It allowed for us to not have to send out a 30 person burn team two to three hours time and pay to go out to the site and see, well, we're going to have to shut it down. Well, we still have to pay our people that time and we didn't waste the time and or the money sending them out there at the trail Lost Creek burn as we were able to shut it down from the office. You know, the trending of the weather parameters of dialing it in tighter on the right day of the burn. There were some businesses that were right near our burn. One was a gas company, 100 feet away from the fire line. So we had to have a northwest wind to burn there. And we trended that, dialed it in when we burned that unit. Um, having more of a westerly to miss the airport, the Medford airport. So a couple days of data that would show what time of day and dialed that in tighter to make that, uh, talked about the on-site assessment, saving the time, you know, just having those weather monitoring timelines 
is every burn we do have, we have to write a burn plan for, and we write a prescription that fits the timeline, the fuels, the objectives of the burn. For example, the airport burn was for ecological habitat enhancement and fire reduction. It was grass and oak woodland. It was to re reduce the Medusa head grass spread by burning it at the time of year when the seed is not quite ripened and we go in and we burn the grass and it kicks back, knocks that back, sterilizes those seeds. And also there are these vernal pools in that area where there's a organism called fairy shrimp and they can live hundreds of years and their eggs are hard shelled and can be transferred and moved around by birds or other animals, but it's very site specific to this area. And also with this platform, the SCAMP, we could take the weather observations and put in a spot weather forecast with NOAA weather out of Medford, Oregon to really, you know, include them, professional weather forecasters in, in uh, weather data. And it really helped in narrowing that down. And, you know, we were very successful. And I attribute some of that, most of that to the SCAMP being uh, creating efficiencies in time and just really fine tuning the actual burn window to meet the the timeline and the prescription of the burn plan. Thank you, sir. Fantastic. Uh, next slide, please. So, you know, and it's as Sean and I talked through this, we understand, you know, that uh, as as we are impacted here in the United States of America, just, you know, it was primarily in the Pacific Northwest or the Western states or even some of the Southern states. Uh, but we're actually seeing, you know, the impact this year uh, in the Midwest, you know, over on the East Coast where the, the fire, you know, everybody knows that they, basically Canada is on fire. And we understand that, you know, the, <clears throat> the influence from some of those fires is far, far reaching. And if you have a device out there where you can communicate with the public to say, hey, we got, you know, we got some uh, kind of dangerous conditions out there as far as the contaminant level. Uh, of course, there's AQI uh, information available for everybody online. This is just one more tool to help support that. Um, and we understand that this problem, uh, it's, it's not just relegated to the United States of America or even Canada. This is a global issue. And we really feel like the SCAMP is a global solution uh, to apply to a global problem. And so, um, you know, next slide, please. Uh, we talked a little bit about, you know, the other applications, you know, prescribed burning. Sean has gone into great detail about that. And that's what's the focus design for this, um, you know, weather and emissions modeling. Uh, we, we feel like after natural disasters, uh, you know, there's there's need for aftermath monitoring as well for, you know, contamination from carbon monoxide or even particulate. Um, that could be dangerous to communities and populations. Um, near, road, near roadside monitoring, uh, MET1 has, has been doing this kind of monitoring forever. Uh, and we have multiple devices, but the SCAMP is also being included in that arena now um, to obtain localized particulate data for community health and policy. So uh, it, it's near and dear to my heart in Southern Oregon for local schools to be able to make really good science-based decisions on the quality of the air outside for for outdoor activities for you know physical education or for, for after school activities you know for sports etc because they have to make the administration has to be able to make good sound decisions on the health and welfare of not just the students but also the faculty um, and this is a device that could be you know basically uh, deployed around our community uh, for schools to be able to make good on-site decisions because, you know, our high schools might be spread as far apart as, as 15 miles. And if you only have one or two devices that can monitor the, the, the local area, but not really at the school, you really can't make a good decision. And this device would help be able to make uh, those administrators to make really good, critical, sound decisions um, at their local schools. Um, you know, environmental cleanup sites, fugitive emissions, you know, these are emissions from uh, maybe companies that aren't really aware that they might be contamination contaminating the local area. So this is a device that can help uh, monitor that, detect that, and they can make further decisions based on what they want to do. Um, mines and bulk storage facilities um, are just a couple other applications. And so, um, Sean, you and I had talked just briefly um, before the webinar about a, another application. And I wonder if you could just remember what that was and just touch base with that. 
Well, we talked about, you know, the smoke management a little bit in the state of Oregon. And, you know, that comes also down to the EPA and the DEQ, you know, and sometimes we have to get permits and the good to go from them. And, you know, really taking care into this and monitoring, you know, our smoke output is very important to the communities. It's important to people. You know, on wildfires, firefighters breathe in smoke and, you know, this excessive smoke that's dumped in, you know, we got to keep keep eyes on that. You know, the the CO2 can be, uh, you know, harmful also, but also in the state of Oregon, there's some heat illness and smoke exposure for just uh, non wildfire or burning applications during wildfire suppression and prescribed burning. We are exempt, but. Otherwise, just out doing fuels hazard reduction, doing project work, doing any other type of projects, we have to adhere to guidelines in the heat indexes and, you know, take care of our employees better, provide shade if it's over 85 degrees and allow other breaks. If it's over 95, um, provide longer breaks, provide cool water less than 48 degrees and stuff like that. We could use this to, to monitor our crews and just really take care of our people. Here at Grayback, we take high degree of effort in taking care of our people. That's one reason why I've been here this long as the owner of the company started as a smoke jumper and, you know, takes care of his people, does the best we can with it. And this is just another tool in the toolbox to, to enhance that care you know, of, uh, you know, heat exposure, smoke exposure, if we're not on the wildfire and just, you know, overall, you know, health of our workforce. Wonderful. Uh, thank you. Next slide, please. Okay. I'm going to turn this back over to Graham to close out the webinar. Thank you, gentlemen, very much. Great information there. I uh, wanted to also point out that there is a white paper available about this new SCAMP technology. You can reach it either on our website or using the QR code there at the, uh, the corner of this slide. A lot, of, lot more detailed information and images of the, uh, of the device in use. Also, uh, if you want to come and talk to Bill more about this technology, about this new platform, we'll be at the National Wildfire Suppression Association's annual conference this December, five through seven. So please, uh, please come in and chat about it. You can see the device in person, uh, get a hands-on um, tour of the device and how it works. And it looks like we do have one question um, to field for the Q&A session here from Wayne. Uh, he's asking, what is the physical size and weight of the SCAMP? Uh, physical size is about 10 and a half inches by 10 and a half inches by about 21 inches tall. So, you know, I'm a, that's actually conservative. It's about 10 by 10 by 20 and it weighs just over 20 pounds. All right. Looks like that's the only question we have for the Q&A. We're a little bit over time. So thank you all for hanging in there with us and, uh, and joining us for this webinar. Thank you again, Bill and Sean. Great, Great Graham, information. Stand by, Graham. It looks like there might be a couple other things that popped up. Uh, in the chat. I see. Um, Sean, uh, are you seeing the agencies moving forward with the application of the, of the SCAMP, such as U.S. Forest Service, BLM, Oregon, Oregon Department of Forestry? Currently, there's a lot of interest in it. We've been in the R&D phase with Bill and Met One. Um, there is interest in it. I could see them moving forward. Uh, there's a couple wildland fire use modules that are out there that are interested in this. Uh, I think they just need to you know, see it in use more. And that's one thing. We just need to get this out there. And once you use it, like I have, you'll want to keep using it. Awesome. And then Reba is asking, uh, has there been any discussion about subsidizing this device through government or having entities like state or counties acquiring them uh, in order to rent them out to, 
to the agencies and the organizations doing these prescribed burns? There has been talk about uh, getting getting some of these with grants for various agencies um, and collaborative groups. One thing that's big in Oregon right now is collaborative groups that are, you know, 5, 10, 15 people, different agencies, community members, organizations that come together and, and work to solve some of these problems to increase the pace and scale to get the buy-in from society that doing nothing is not the answer. And with this device, you know, bringing it to the front row of people's houses and seeing it in use can help fine tune that and, and show that we as practitioners of prescribed fire are doing everything we can to provide best information to maintain the health and welfare of our community members. So with that said, I could see, you know, these being used throughout the state, you know, DEQ may be interested in some of that and getting them out there as they have some hard, hard burns, such as, you know, in Bend, Oregon, west of there is, uh, you know, the Deschutes National Forest, and there's a lot of work being done there. And as predominantly, there's a westerly flow. So having these in place to, you know, monitor and get a northerly flow to take care of the burn would be ideal. So yes, I could see them, you know, taking off with some of these. Excellent. And one last question. Uh, so if this was deployed in an actual wildfire situation rather than a prescribed burn situation, uh, how would it be deployed and operated? You, have, you, have you thought that through? Yes. I, you know, I get called out to do these large scale burnouts. You know, we bring our drone sometimes and our burn team. I would deploy it out on the fire line. You know, it would monitor just the same as a prescribed burn, because if we're doing a burnout or a backfire on a large wildfire, it's basically a big prescribed burn. And we've had some where we've, you know, had 63 miles of line to burn out on the big windy fire, you know, years ago. And, you know, just having a couple of these on site, monitoring the weather, being able to have the data, being able, having the data saved and being able to go back in time and it extract that and you can even click on the link and print it out so you have the the real-time monitoring you have the historical data um, that can really fine-tune on the time to do these large burnouts on wildfires because most of the time if the fire forces our hand we got to do it when our hand is forced but if our hand, hand is not forced we're going to be looking to burn into the night or mostly night burning these will really help that. Sean, do you see these being useful in actual fire camps where, you know, carbon monoxide uh, resident is, is more and more of an issue for firefighter safety? Um, you feel like this would be a useful tool for, for fire camps on some of those large complexes? I do. Last year was the first time I've seen uh, air quality monitor concerned with firefighters in camp here at the Rum Creek Fire in Southern Oregon. And I could see that, you know, through the years, I know, you know, wildland firefighters use a bandana mainly or a N95 mask for, you know, dealing with smoke exposure. Other than that, you're, you're toughing it out. So firefighter health has become a big concern and, you know, the smoke exposure, you know, I've uh, been in it a bit and I've, looking forward of, you know, taking care of our people and myself more. So I could see this being used by fire teams in fire camps. Cool. Thank you. And one more question from Wayne. Um, he's, uh, he's saying, we, you mentioned historical data. Uh, how far back can you see? Is it hours, days, weeks, or, you know, the full, the full time it was deployed? So we have the ability to go in and there to, to tell the, the web portal how many pieces of, of data that we want to view. I mean, it stores all of it, but whatever's available, we can basically go in and say, if you want 10,000 records, you know, that could that could equate to two, three months worth of time, uh, depending on the interval, the sample interval. So basically, as far back as you want to go, especially during the, the burn season, uh, all that data would be accessible. 
Excellent. Well, thank you again, gentlemen. Uh, and just as a reminder, you can get more information about this device on met1.com. And feel free to, re to connect with us uh, at Met One Instruments on LinkedIn. You can reach out with any questions you need uh, answers to beyond this webinar through our website or through LinkedIn. And uh, thanks again, everybody. Thanks, everybody. And thank you, Sean. You're welcome. Thanks, everyone.